Now that we're done studying the stars that the galaxies are made out of, it's time to actually study the galaxies. And what better place to start than our own home galaxy? Unfortunately, it's one of our most difficult tasks in terms of obtaining specific information because we live inside the galaxy, somewhere around here. There is a Sagittarius arm and Perseus arm that we have identified, and here's an, the Orion Spur, and we're somewhere nestled right in there, invisible, as far as our particular solar system is concerned. And this, of course, is not an image of our galaxy because we've never been outside our galaxy to take an image of it. But it's a pretty nice artist's rendition of our very wonderful, beloved home galaxy. So let's investigate our galaxy in a little more detail and then on to galaxies in general and the rest of the cosmos. There certainly wasn't much known about our galaxy before recent times. Historically, our galaxy was considered to be something perhaps like a grindstone with the sun close to its center. But the first real serious attempt to map our galaxy was by William Herschel in 1785, building telescopes and making optical observations of the stars in every direction. So this is basically a, a star count of the stars in every direction from our home location. You get a very weird amoeba shaped thing. Now his assumption was that every that in every direction you look the stars should be uniformly distributed. So around the galaxy the stars are uniform so if you count oh a certain number that corresponds to the depth of the galaxy. So in this direction less stars were counted therefore the galaxy was not as extensive in spatial extent in this direction but out here of course more. One of his most serious limitations was that he didn't realize just how much interstellar extinction produced a diminishing effect on the light from the stars. So for instance looking toward the center of the galaxy interesting notch here well that kind of makes sense from the standpoint that the center of our galaxy is hidden by dust and gas. But in any case, this is based on data, so it was a good step in the right direction. A very key tool for discovering distances is one we've already encountered, and they are the Cepheids. It was in 1912 that Henrietta Leavitt discovered these variable stars studying the small Magellanic Cloud. And here, just for review, is once again what it looks like on an HR diagram, and especially giant and supergiant stars in the instability region as they move back and forth across here. They're unstable in this part of their life because they're absorbing and emitting photons as a result of their interaction with helium. And they're doing this for a short period of time, but during that time they manifest the period luminosity relationship which is that large or bright Cepheids have a very long period and the fainter Cepheids, the dimmer Cepheids, have a faster period. They're also smaller, physically smaller. So this period luminosity relationship has been then and now instrumental in discovering distance scales in the galaxy and in particular the globular clusters as we'll now see. And we've already encountered the clusters, but another quick review. We have the open clusters, the young, cluster, the, the young stars, recently formed, bright blue stars you can see there, hundreds to thousands in any given open cluster. They will eventually disperse. They're not gravitationally bound. Then the globulars, they consist of many more members. They are old stars, and they're concentric basically. It tends to be spherical and they're concentrated toward the center regions. Tens of thousands to even over a million stars in the globular clusters and they're located around the galactic halo which we'll discuss shortly also. The good news is that Cepheid variables are seen in the globular clusters and that they're located symmetrically around the halo of the galaxy. This was originally by Harlow Shapley, assumed, subsequently confirmed. But in this way, the globulars can be used 
to figure out the particular location that we have in the galaxy by mapping out the positions of the globular clusters in the Milky Way. So, when you obtain these positions, you have a really interesting scenario that Harlow Shapley discovered. That the globulars are positioned over the entire sky, you see them in every direction, but they're very concentrated in the region of Sagittarius and Scorpius. So, this had a demonstrated a pre preponderance of the globulars in this region. Now, Shapley didn't know that there were two different varieties of Cepheids, the type 1 and the type 2, as we've discussed, the, the high metal and low metal ones. We kind of got that messed up, but nevertheless, the idea was very correct. Down in the corner here, we see a re this little square has over a million stars that comes from this region here. That also includes two prominent globular clusters. So this is the scenario that we find in terms of the distribution of globular clusters across the sky. Well, what does that mean? Well, what it means is that a statistical analysis could be done on these stars to discover the center of the globulars, which should also be the center of the Milky Way. And that turned out to be right here in this crude simplistic picture. Well, it did not coincide with our location, of course, so it turns out that there's about 26,000 light years between our location and the statistical center of the location of the globulars, which has subsequently been validated that that indeed is also the center of our galaxy. So this vastly increased the size of our universe our galaxy, which was considered the universe, and it made it much, much bigger than before. As we look to the center of our galaxy in visible light, it's not all that impressive. And the reason is, as we've already come to know, the gas and dust obscures our view. But this obscuration, or this extinction of light as a result of the dust, is very tremendous. In fact, it's about 30 magnitudes worth. What does that mean? That means about one out of a trillion visible photons actually gets through. Therefore, we really don't see anything invisible toward the center of our galaxy. So that's something to keep in mind as we consider the difficulty in mapping our galaxy from what we see. A very important feature of neutral hydrogen is one that helps us get a good handle on the gas that makes up the galaxy. Neutral hydrogen, proton and electron, and they have spin states. So considering the electron, there's two possible spin states. If the spin is in the same direction as the proton, it's in a higher energy configuration than if it's in has the opposite spin. And very infrequently, but nevertheless statistically will happen, there will be a spin flip transition where the electron spontaneously flips to the lower energy position the lower energy configuration and in doing so will release a photon because there's a reduction in energy it releases a 21 centimeter photon that is a characteristic signature of neutral hydrogen the 21 centimeter photon which is a radio photon and that can actually be observed with radio telescopes and it passes through dust so that is very useful the galactic gas distribution in the galaxy then can be discovered and also the motion of the gas by observing the Doppler shift of that particular emission so that's really useful so here we have our galaxy and here we are in the solar system and observing gas clouds with different motions, position 1, 2, 3, and 4, we see different motions of the gas at different locations. And by studying the 21 centimeter line, we can not only identify where that gas is, but also what its relative motion is, at least the radio component. So with extensive and difficult research into this, a uh, distribution of the hydrogen gas in the galaxy can start to be understood. And this enables us to begin to map
the galaxy itself. And it starts revealing the spiral arm structure also. A better way to reveal the spiral arm structure is to recognize that the spiral arms themselves are revealed by the presence of bright OB stars. So when there are bright OB stars, you see blue and reddish regions. The bluish tints are from the stars themselves, and the reddish regions are the ionized gas, and which is hydrogen, and then via the Balmer emission line, you're revealing the red region. So these regions where the O and B stars are being formed are called OB associations. And the distances to the OB associations can be discovered because of the presence of Cepheid variables in those regions. Well, how fortunate this is. So here are some OB associations in this Faison beautiful galaxy here. There's a whole bunch of them. There's more, uh, but let's just continue to put circles around them here. <laughs> so this thing is fraught with many new stars being formed. Bright OB star associations revealing themselves quite clearly. So these are spiral tracers. They can trace out the spirals because that's where the bright regions exist. That's the only place they exist. This also exists in the Milky Way as well, even in addition to this, this face-on view, which is easier to see. It's easier to discover them in other galaxies, but we can do it in our galaxy as well. Of course, with the dust limitations, we can't get all the way across our galaxy this way, but we can see these OB associations, at least to the nearest arms, the closest arms to us. So here is combined data from the 21 centimeter and the OB star association investigations. From the 21 centimeter line, we get a pretty good handle on the distribution of gas in large areas of the galaxy. Here we are, and we can see quite a bit, quite a bit of distance. And although Doppler shift gives us some information about the motions, it still doesn't reveal clearly the spiral structure. Over on the right, the spiral arms become into greater clarity by the investigation of the OB associations, the real bright regions, so that's really useful. Unfortunately, we can only see maybe about 24,000 light years in that way. But here we are at the solar system, looking toward the center of the galaxy, we encounter the Sagittarius arm. In the other direction, we encounter the Perseus arm, so that at least is fairly clearly observable by this method of observing the bright stars and at least gives us a pretty pretty good detail about our local neighborhood what the galaxy looks like deeper than that we can observe carbon monoxide emission and using this and other techniques we're starting to get a handle on the overall structure of our galaxy as a whole and that structure has been put together into a map of our galaxy. That's the best one we have to date based on data. I'm sure the galaxy doesn't really look this way if you take an outside view, but it is not just a fanciful artistic impression rendition, but rather based on data. So we have a bar in the center and some significant arms. Here we are, our location. We encounter the Sagittarius arm. The Orion Spur here and the Perseus arm outside of that. And so that is a pretty awesome assemblage of information here to see what our galaxy looks like. And I look forward to the future when we will see this in yet greater detail as our techniques to discern the details of the galaxy improve all the time. Let's take a look at the geometry of our Milky Way as we understand it. Again, very difficult because we live inside of it. It's hard to determine distances because of the obscuration of gas and dust to keep us from seeing it very clearly. But we do have data, and the data is pretty solid at this point in terms of what we do have. Namely, it's a spiral galaxy characterized by spiral arms. So visually, it's easy to tell, generally, if a galaxy is a spiral or not. It's easy to see those, those arms. 
The spiral arms are part of a flat disk. The overall galaxy itself is more of a disk-shaped shape, and the spiral arms are part of that disk. Surrounded by a central bulge, there's a bulge. You can see the spatial extent of the bulge in this drawing down here. The whole disk is surrounded by a fairly sparse halo. Around this entire galactic disk, we have a halo that where the globular clusters are. There's about 200 of them. We haven't discovered them all yet, but they're there. To be discovered, we discovered most of them. About 100,000 light years in overall diameter. The disk is about 1,000 light years thick. It could be thinner than that, but there's up and down motion as well as just the very orderly disk rotation motion. The bulge is about 6,000 light years, a little thicker. The sun is about halfway out if you consider the full extent of the galaxy. A little more perhaps, but the galaxy extends out a little bit beyond what you can generally see. And there are two dwarf galaxies, at least, colliding with the Milky Way right now. They are the Sagittarius and Canis Major dwarfs. They're acting as hors d'oeuvres for our big old Milky Way galaxy that wants to continue producing stars. So these dwarf galaxies have a tendency to stir things up a little bit and produce or enhance the ability of the Milky Way to continue its star production activities, which it needs additional fresh gas and dust to do so. So that's a basic overview again of our of our galaxy and approximately what it looks like in its various dimensions.